Father, we acknowledge you here today. And, and every other protocol observed, I just, I'm so scared to, to, to touch what's going on here, you know, and to displace it. So, pardon me, sir. We honor you and every leader. I just, I was praying this morning, I failed to share a concept the Lord had taught me over the years, the, the concept of the total and effective ministry, the total ministry or psalmist, the total ministry, very soft. The idea and concept of the total psalmist is to underscore the need to be well and all rounded. Can you help me with the feedback? It's feeding back. Yesterday, the man of God, in his introductory speech, welcoming us to the conference, emphasized the need to make full proof of our music ministry. Ministry that would see longevity, posterity, and sustainability. And to achieve this and understanding of the concept of the total minstrel is very vital. And as we go on, you would understand the idea. And because of my time, I'll just read out the points. Why the total psalmist? You know, there are some who believe, and particularly this morning, I know we have, you know, like a mixed multitude. There are people here who just love God and who love to worship God, who may not be called and appointed into the music ministry who are here. You know, who just are worshippers, but just felt to come and get knowledge. However, this is specifically for those who have been earmarked by God to serve, to minister full time, you know, and that's their calling in life, to just wait, inquire in his presence and then minister before his people. So there are people who believe that all you need is just the anointing and a heart and passion for the Lord and that is very true to an extent, you see. Once you are a believer, you know, I mean, God, God wants to hear you. He wants to hear your voice. He wants to hear you worship him, whether or not you're on, you're on key or not. And that's because there is a joyful noise department for the believer. Okay, so it's okay to, you know, just have a passion and, you know, and a love for God. However, if you're called to, to stand before the Lord and also help people minister before him, you will require more. For those who function as psalmists, as ministers, there's more. Amen. And I'm going to be sharing about five, six points. Number one, a minstrel first let's read our text first Samuel 16 verse 18 if you have the NLT version please give me first Samuel 16 first Samuel 16 one of the servants said to Saul one of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem is a talented player. Another translation says he's skillful. Not only that, he is brave. Two, he's a warrior. Three, he's a man of war. Four, he has good judgment. Five, he's also a fine looking young man. Six, and the Lord is with him. I'm going to quickly read from the New King James. It says, 
and from verse 17 so Saul said to his servants provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me notice that what opened the door to the palace was not pray well what play well skill amen then one of the servants answered and said look i have seen a son of jesse the bethlehemite who is skillful in playing a mighty man of valor a man of war prudent in speech and a handsome man and the lord is with him in this verse of scripture lies my concept of the total psalmist say the total psalmist spirit skill character the total psalmist my number one point a mission or a psalmist must first be one a true worshiper say true worshiper can you say true worshiper i know that that seems very obvious at first but let me explain many times we associate singing and playing of the instrument in church to be a worshiper so from time to time people call me and say pastor nathaniel please i'm a worshiper can you help me with this what they are trying to tell me is that they are singers you know they are musicians but you see if you are a born again Christian, if you are a believer, you are a worshiper. Say you are a worshiper. So every believer is a worshiper. We fail to understand that in scripture, in Genesis 25, in, in Genesis 22 verse 5, where the word worship was first mentioned, there was no recourse to music. You know? The first mention of worship in scripture, if we put the scripture up, there was no mention of scripture. But the Bible says there was worship. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. There was no choir. There was no Dr. Panam, no Micah, no Nathaniel, no Dr. Nenche, no choir. They called it worship. Because in that context, worship was surrender, was sacrifice. It was the giving up of something precious to the Lord. Amen. So, a minstrel or a psalmist must understand that he is first a worshiper. He is first a Christian before he's an instrumentalist. Because many times, an understanding of this shapes how you behave. Shapes how you act off the stage. Many of us think that when we come on stage as psalmists and ministers, that's when we begin worship. How, however, that's not the case. We don't start worshiping on stage. We only continue worship on stage. And that word worship in the Hebrew is the word shaka. It means to prostrate. And, you know, it's speaking more of the inward posture. It's to pay homage to royalty. It's to surrender. It's to fall down. It's to reverence. It's to make obeisance. So the generic meaning of worship is a life laid down before God Romans 12 I beseech thee therefore brethren by the message of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice so a, 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 a minstrel must first understand that you are first a worshiper one whose life is in alignment in obedience to the Lord so you are not a worshiper because you sing you are not a worshiper because you play an instrument you are a worshiper that sings this is important because it will determine how you you live and you impact your world around you and how you live your life off stage if not we will tend to put up our best behaviors when we come on stage we will be spiritual when it's time for leading praise worship not knowing is an entire lifestyle tell somebody it's an entire lifestyle and let me give you a few points on that Point one, under point one of being a worshiper, 
a major feature of a worshiper is authenticity say authenticity and sincerity no better person in scripture exemplifies that than the man david the man david that's why in psalm 51 verse 6 he says thou desires truth in the inward part in other words you it's you look beyond what's outside you want real people authentic people you don't want people who are coming to to put up a show god is not looking for actors he's looking for worshipers a worshiper is not an actor is a, a worshiper is what you see is what you get he's sincere he's authentic point two on that one is a worshiper is a lover of god is a lover is someone who is intimate and affectionately in love with god is someone that has a relationship mentality someone who spends time and what do lovers do lovers spend time lovers spend time i remember when i was cutting my wife i, I was living in lagos and she was in eket okay i would, I would fly to eket to acquire boom became just look like going from who say one to who say two because i had passion we would spend time together when i go there i would see her off we'll walk i'll walk her to her house and then she'll walk me back and then we went back back and forth okay bye bye i'll see you tomorrow love you then we'll go back again bye bye okay you're going to your hotel bye bye that's what lovers do they spend time oh my time is let me rush through this a worshiper is someone who gazes at God. Psalm 27 verse 4, David says, One thing have I desired, that will I seek after. That I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Beholding the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. A worshiper is a gazer. It's giving to devotion, fellowship. C, humility. A proud worshiper is a contradiction. One evidence that you know God is that you are humble. The more you see God, the less you see yourself. Number four, purity. At home, read Psalm 15, Psalm 15, verse 1. Psalm 15, verse 1 says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Psalm 24, verse 3 and 4. Psalm 24, verse 3. And four, Psalm 24, verse 3 and 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that had clean hands and a pure heart, who had not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Too many talented and gifted mistresses off stage living like the devil. That you are talented does not make sexual immorality right. Still a sin. A worshiper is one who lives in spirit and in truth. John 4, 23, 24, the Bible says he seeketh those to worship him in spirit and in truth. And what is to worship in spirit? Philippians 3, 3 tries to explain for us. Philippians 3, 3 says we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. First of all, that in spirit means that we are in Christ. And what's he talking about circumcision? It's the circumcision of the heart. Romans 229 Romans 229 Romans 229 you must understand that in the Old Testament okay let, let's read but he is the Jew please put it up for me he's the Jew which is one 
inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God. Please understand that in the Old Testament the focus was more on the externals. People focused on the forms, on rituals, on 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 the on the routines from the outside but god had a desire he had a desire that a time will come when worship will be in spirit in other words when it would be from the inside out when it won't just be an outward show but rather an inward conviction manifest on the outside that's why we wrote the song, casting crowns, lifting hands, and bowing hearts. Because before you bow outside, make sure your heart is bowed. If you are prostrating outside and your heart is not bowing, all you are doing is press up. Because it's a show, it becomes a show. We worship in spirit from the heart. It's first there. It flows from there. That's why Jesus says, he said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. What did he say? He says, in vain. In other words, that's false worship. That's not true worship. That's wrong worship. That's why David is one I call a New Testament saint who lived in the old covenant. He will say in Psalm 51 verse 6, he says, thou desires truth in the inward parts. In, in other words, Lord, all of these sacrifices, you know, are not the things you are interested. You are, in, you are, you're, you're focused more on the contrite heart and the right spirit. Any wonder also Jesus could not stand the Pharisees and Sadducees. And in Matthew 23 verse 27, Matthew 23 verse 7, he spoke so angrily. I call them hypocrites. For you are like unto whited sepulchres which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. It has to be from the inside out. And truth, what is the truth? There's spirit and truth. What is the truth? John 17, 17. John 17, 17. Jesus says, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Jesus also says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So what is the truth? Jesus, what is the truth the word it means word based worship so you are a songwriter you are a scribe you when when you write our songs we are reeling out the revelation of god the revelation of his word amen number 2 you must be called say you must be called you see the bible says no man take this honor unto himself First Chronicles 25 verse 1, we see that David appointed, you know, musicians and got him and Jedith and Asaph to instruct them, to train them. So these were people who were specially selected to minister before God. I always say to people, you see, one of the things that can help you deal with the challenges is the knowledge and idea that where you are, God put you there, God called you. A clear idea of your calling will help bring a clear idea of purpose, which always produces effectiveness and impact. Amen. Number three, skill. Say skill. Say skill. Skill is applying yourself to your craft. Yes, it's true that God watches the heart. You see, but you see, if you are a worship leader, whilst heaven may receive your worship, your off key can distract some people here on earth. So you apply yourself, and skill does not come by prayer and fasting. Skill comes by simple, repetitive task over time, having a routine and regiment of practice. And sometimes a lack of skill can make delivery difficult Paul says study to show yourself approved a lack of skill you musically handicapped you have these expressions in you but you can't get them out it can limit you ministerially 
it may limit your influence and your reach you see and i tell people god loves you too much to embarrass you so sometimes he won't open some doors tell somebody develop yourself tell somebody develop yourself psalm 33 verse 3 all jesus he says play skillfully with a loud noise is important number four character say character if you have skill and you don't have character as a musician you are an accident waiting to happen character is the fragrance that your life exudes character is the infrastructure that hosts your gift it is the very life and fragrance of christ as seen and evident in a life Second Corinthians 2 Corinthians 2.15, 2 Corinthians 2.15 says, Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance, rising up to God. Character is the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. And Jesus said, it is by thy fruit we know them. It is by the fruit, not by their gift. There are, there are many people who have incredible gifts who will get to heaven and the gates of heaven and find out that they don't have any business there. May that not be our portion in Jesus' name. And character, and the fruit as, it, as, as, as the word implies, is grown. There is a process of growing fruit. My time is up. Let me just read out the fifth one. Character is, is, is evolving to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And sometimes bad character can make people doubt the authenticity of your gift. There are some, there are some men, young men of God I know, very gifted prophetically. I mean, they will prophesy accurately. But you see, the way they live their lives will make you feel that they don't even know God. Number five, and I'll stop here. The presence and the power of the Spirit. 1 Samuel 16, 18, Saul's servant ended by saying, and God was with him. And the Lord was with him. If you have every other thing and the Lord is not with you, you are nothing. The difference between the minstrel that opens the heaven and the minstrel that makes noise is the presence of God. Exodus 33 verse 14 and 16 the Lord put this scripture when I began newly when I encountered this scripture and he said my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest for wherein shall it be known that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight is it not in that thou goest with us so shall we be separate I and thy people from all the people that are upon the face of the earth in other words Moses was saying there are two kinds of psalmist there's the anointed one with your presence and they are the noise makers. There are two kinds of pastors. There's the anointed one with your presence and the noise makers. There are two groups of choirs, the anointed ones and with the presence and noise makers. David said, I mean, Moses said, what makes the difference is your presence. And if your presence is not with us, don't send me, don't send us. As a music minister, you must, that must be your uppermost desire. Every time I go into a service and they say, ask God for one thing. I don't ask God for material things. I say, Lord, your presence. Your presence. That thing that makes a man come to the stage and the very first sound of the trumpet, the atmosphere changes. That's what I want. I don't want money. Because money will follow that. I don't want fame. Because fame will follow that. I don't want platforms because platforms will follow that. So beloved, my prayer for us as we leave this conference is that we will not just be one-sided and to be effective in these last days, God is looking for people who are rounded who are anointed, who carries tangible presence, who are skillful, 
who have character, who are comely, who, who, who spend time with him, who are authentic, sincere. In other words, they are not coming to put up a show. In the inner deep recesses of their lives, what you see outside is who they are inside. Can we bow our heads and say, Father, I want to be that total, complete service. Not just one who, who's very gifted, who, who, who relies on his gift, but that off the stage, without my trumpet and my song, people will see Christ. There are people who love the Lord on the altar, but they are terror to their wives when they get home. You know, sometimes when I have little disagreements with my wife, I can't, I can't pray. Because I know the Holy Ghost is not PDP or APC. He's not a politician. When I go there saying, I love you, Lord, they love your wife first. This morning I was watching Dr. Panam, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm a learner. I was watching Dr. Panam. He was about to leave for the, the hotel. You know, and this protocol man did a good job, went there and opened the door for Dr. Panam. And guess what Dr. Panam said? He said, please leave me, go do that for my wife first. And I'm sure he didn't know I, I, I picked that up. I'm like, that's what it is. It's, it's a life of worship outside the stage. It's an entire life. Father, we thank you for this conference. Your presence is strong. Your word is real. We pray, oh God, that you begin a new walk in every life that will leave this conference overflowing with new grace and glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. God bless you.